All right, we ready to roll? All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. We did have a, a little bit of a glitch with our link, so I'm glad that you all found us. Um, I almost didn't find us, uh, but we were, we're all here. We're excited to go. Um, we're very excited to talk about the Texas Triangle. It's pretty exciting. I love living in Texas. For those of you that don't know, Texas is an amazing place. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Shar, if you want to start presenting, yes, we'll sir. get rolling. Give me just a second. I'll knock it out. Uh, and nobody says I have good music taste when I play my music. Tabber, you know we love I'm you. I'm just loving the shout outs. Yes. Yes, I picked today. Maroon 5 for everyone. <laughs> awesome. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Wednesday Massive Masters Wednesday case study. We're super excited to have everybody here. We appreciate it. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. We'll either answer them during the presentation or at the end, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Disclaimer, this is an educational series where Massive Capital is talking about what we believe is true, what we believe is happening. We are not lawyers, accountants, or financial advisors, but we are telling you what we think is the truth according to Massive Capital. It's a new one I've started, the truth according to Massive Capital. So if you have been living in a rock and you don't know it, we are about to have an amazing event in Dallas, Texas. We're super excited about this. It's, it's going to be so much fun. So it's buying multifamily in a day. There's a QR code. I'm also going to put here in the chat. And I'm also going to add one more event that we're doing in Dallas. If you're going to be in Dallas already, is we are visiting one of our properties. We call it an educational property tour. There is nothing better than actually seeing a property firsthand, being able to go there, see a unit that hasn't been renovated, see one that's being renovated, see one that's all ready to lease, understand the, the forced appreciation value of taking an apartment complex. Now we've owned this one for a little bit of time, so a lot of the exterior work is already done, but it's super impressive for you to see that. Um, you can join us, it's free. Um, and we just our goal is just to add as much value as we can so that people can understand what we're doing, what we're working on, everything. So we hope that we see you in Dallas. It's worth the trip if you're out of town. I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna be a great day. So we'll talk a little bit about massive capital, um, massive value add to investors and partners. Today, we're doing the underwriting series number one, which is the Texas Triangle, which is really goes from Dallas, runs all the way through Austin down to San Antonio and over to Houston. It's an amazing one. And then we're going to do Colorado, and then we're going to do North and South Carolina next month, just to talk about why we, why we like that market. So, and even better, if you come on Wednesday, Friday and Saturday, Marie is flying in from the dark north. She's coming in. She's going to be hanging out with me for the day. I love hanging out with Maria. She always brings a lot of value and a lot of fun. So make sure that you come to the tour and you come to our all-day event. Looking forward to it. All right, so Massive Capital. We are obviously very Texas-centric. You can see we have assets in Dallas, San Antonio, Houston. We also have assets in Colorado and North Carolina and Georgia. Probably why we're talking about Colorado and uh, the Carolinas, because we have assets there. Massive Capital is an equity fund. Triple net brokerage on the retail side. Property management on the retail side. Land development. Triple net construction, again, not on multifamily at this moment, but on commercial lifestyle type centers. We also have tech and, of course, the Massive Masters. So you can see here Massive Capital is partnered up with Realty One. They are our triple net brokerage house. They are contractors for that. And they have almost $300 million in assets. Massive Capital has just over $200 million in assets. So we are really 
really looking forward to that. Very excited about it. Hope that you can you can continue to keep joining with us. Oh, we just went live screen, so everybody better smile. All right. So we have one more webinar for Horizon. We have five spots left. All right, and tomorrow we're going to talk about Horizon, and we're going to talk about what have we done since we've taken over. So we've actually had a team there today taking fresh pictures. We managed to get the folks that are on our asset management team to go to be able to take some fresh pictures. We're going to have some fresh updated financials. So again, if you haven't invested in this particular deal, it is a 506C for accredited investors. Um, there's a sign up link. And let me tell you, even if you're not an accredited investor, show up and learn. You're always going to learn something. You're going to learn something that we do on a deal. So super excited about that. Um, and then it, we have actually, I think it's nine LOIs out. They updated us this morning <laughs> on the call. Nine LOIs out. We're going to win at least two of those, I think. They're looking good. So we're super excited about it. Um, the team was driving all around Houston today looking at some assets. We have a, all of the rest of our team is in San Antonio looking at assets. And for those of you that don't know, Massive Capital closed 15 deals in 22 and 23. So we're super excited. Um, we hope that you'll come along the journey with us. I'm going to put a link in the chat where you can book a call with our investor relations team. Um, make sure that you do. We're really excited to be able to talk to you. Hey, Trevor, one more thing. I uh, yes. forgot to add it. Yes, we have nine LOIs pending and the number two is under contract already. Number three, hopefully it's going under contract today. We had a we had a partner call. We went and met with everybody else. It's a Johnson development, pretty awesome deal. So that's why I was like, when I came back, it was like, yes, we got one. One, hopefully it's a it's a given, but have it got the PSA yet, but I think it's going under contract this week. I will finalize everything. So back to you, man. Awesome. Yeah, we're super, super excited. Uh, I know we've been working super hard trying to get uh, some good deals for our investors. So, all right, I'm going to turn it over to you, Shari. You might want to move your mic a little bit closer. Okay. Is it better? That's good. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so, so thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, our goal is today is to give you a framework of how we look at the market and what we typically know on the surface and how we can quantify, how we can drill down one, two, three layers into it before we set up and you know, going for a deal and trying to understand the competition, how to win it, and really understand the characteristics of the MSA. Um, then we can you know, get into the next phase of underwriting. So. Uh, next uh, next slide, we'll talk about a little bit about how we look at this framework. So this massive masterclass or this masterclass objective is how to get started in multifamily. Uh, there's a lot of different ways we can get into multifamily or new development. Uh, it's, as you can see on the green, it's the uh, on the left side, uh, it's the passive, most passive, uh, then it gets active and active. Uh, LP, which is the limited investor as a limited partner, uh, you come in as an equity partner, and then you bolt on to the sponsor team, which is the general partner, and then put together, uh, we do a deal. And on the far right is the JV model. Uh, but most of our conversation and the case studies, it is geared towards syndication model. Okay. All right. Uh, so what we're looking for, we're always looking for partners uh, because you know we believe uh, there is someone out there needs help just like us, but if we can play together, we are further, you know, we can stay in the game longer and, and we can go further. Uh, so we are, we always look for land JV partners. Uh, we are actively looking to acquire lands uh, off market. And uh, also we are looking to, uh, you know, do JV partnership with the land owners where they roll in uh, the land as an equity becomes LP or JV partner. Then we bring in the construction and lease up and also the management as well. Uh, going back to case in point, earlier today, we have an off market, uh, which is we're directly uh, negotiating or we have negotiated uh, with a, one of the largest uh, developer in Texas uh, with the realty one in their relationship almost 30 plus years. Uh, so they have a, a really class A neighborhood in KD area, Richmond area. Uh, they just released the, the land tracks for the home builders. It is going pretty good. And we have access to a piece of tract and we right size the tract for us to get the best value out of it. 
So super excited. At the same time, retail JV development, we're actively engaging with two owners where one party is rolling in about $17 million worth of land as a JV partner and us and Realty One, we are going to carry on the debt. It's over $30 million debt and we'll do the construction and lease up. So that's it working. We do that just because if I have to, if we have to do a land transaction today, then land, land has to you know, give the price because of the construction cost and the interest rate. So the best way to protect the value of the land, we're staying in as a JV partner as we go. Second one is the multifamily. Yeah, we lead sponsor. Uh, the number one is the acquisition. We're actively looking for assets, either distressed or off-market multifamily assets. Uh, Sanjay was out here today. He flew out from Dallas yesterday. We walked three properties, uh, two partner meetings, and one of the property, uh, I believe we're gonna get it. Uh, it is down south of Houston. It is a pocket listing for a broker, which uh, we had, we've been active with the broker's team for quite a bit now. And again, based on our traction, how intense we are, finally, we're able to see the deal. We're the one of the two and we're very close. We also do asset advisory. Uh, we have our own proprietary asset management software to dashboard to identify gaps for mitigation. Uh, we believe there is a gap uh, in the community or the real estate domain on how to be an asset manager structurally so we can stack multiple assets and manage. So our software rolls that around. So if we're an asset manager and we want to manage three, four, five assets independent to the property management company, that's how we prep ourselves. Uh, we also do KP. Uh, so we do uh, debt and loan guarantor quite a bit uh, as well. Uh, one of the deals that we have under contract, it came from them. Uh, it came from their route. Uh, we have a lead sponsor leading it. We love the team. We're giving them the number two, the asset advisory, and also we're guaranteeing the loan. Uh, then last one we do is the asset consulting service, which is sometime you have a deal. Uh, it's a big of undertaking. You want another deal team to come in and walk you through pre-contract to the contract to contract to close and give you the structure for the capital raising process and you go. So that's that. Uh, put together, it's, we have the massive master's program. Uh, so it's a, it's a deal doing platform. Uh, oftentimes we get a question, what's the value add? And uh, we like to say we are the uh, Kumans of the world. Like we go to school, we learn how to do math. And then you want to do a little bit more extra math, come to Kuman, we'll get you to the grading points. So that's our view of the world. Uh, almost everybody who came into our massive master's program, we are their group number two, if not three, four, and five. So, and that's, that's how we add value. All right, underwriting. So uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, I mean, to talk a little bit about underwriting the market. And the whole idea is that give you guys, uh, introduce as many concepts uh, as we can. So you can take that and you know, run your course um, whenever you have time. So the framework is the idea. Uh, so I'll go through a couple of examples, how we take a look at it, uh, some high level, then I have a couple of slides to talk about some of the detail nuances and hopefully uh, you guys will like it. And again, I go through rather quick usually. Uh, please drop all the questions, comments uh, on the chat. Uh, once I go through the slide, we'll come back and cover. And uh, then you know, the Q&A, it's uh, absolutely welcome for all the questions. Okay, so for us, uh, you know, the journey, a full cycle as a grounding, it takes about three to five years to cycle a multifamily value add. Uh, now, in today's market, it's mostly five years, if not a little bit longer. Uh, so when market is on the bottom, it's longer, multiple it's on the top, it's or going upwards, then it's a shorter one. So either way, when you buy, when we are planning on buying an asset, we are having at least a five years of hold time, then plus or minus one year. It used to be plus or minus two years uh, for your sensitivity. And we break out the acquisition side in a whole five years of journey in three different buckets. It's the acquisition, it's the equity and debt, and then the asset management. What we buy and where we buy in the acquisition, that sets the tone of how to structure the debt and equity. And the location and the debt and equity structure sets the tone for the asset management. So everything goes hand in hand, right? So uh, I was an engineer and my mentor used to always tell me, look, Sharar, when you design something, you gotta know what you're designing for and avoid Chris and across, you know, Cross, crossing paths. What it meant is that if we hire a Ferrari engineer to build a Corolla, we're gonna get the most expensive Ferrari looking Corolla. Or if we hire a Corolla engineer to design a Ferrari, you'll get the 
you know, that's a really low end Ferrari, right? But you just cannot cross it. And that is a tone when you run a class A, you should not bring in a class C property management company, even though they say they can do it. It just, the framework is different. Same thing goes for city. Uh, Houston behaves slightly different than Austin. Austin behaves slightly different than DFW. That behaves different than Colorado. So you gotta understand it. And I'll walk you through a little bit more about it. Okay, so uh, we like this slide. So conventional learning, it's what we call it underwriting is, and a conventional is start wherever you're at. Go look at your backyards within a one or two hours of driving distance. Go with what you can handle, get to know the local brokers and ask for off-market deals. I mean, you guys have heard that at least plenty of times, but go backwards. For us to get an off-market deal, we have to build confidence to the broker that we have done deals before. If I'm brand new, it's a tough one. Hence, doesn't matter how much I get to know the brokers, I'm gonna get on-market deals. That is, everybody's took a look at it. And then go with what you can handle. That's kind of sort of not works out because what I can handle doesn't mean that what my team can handle. And if I'm the lowest performing guy in my team, which is the high performing, I can get way more than what I can handle, right? Driving one to two hour driving distance, if that's a lifestyle, I get it. But the moment you want to buy 10, 15, 20, $30 million of the product, we are an asset manager. We need to know the location and the property and everything else. The, the higher the ticket size, uh, the more the intensity, it becomes a lot more corporate as you kind of take a look into it. So on that note, our thought is start wherever. Just start somewhere. Have some bias for it, but start somewhere. But then what is more important is simulate a purchase. Buying a property in Midwest is different than buying a property in Northeast. But even though in my mind, you know, I can handle any property, but buying power is different. So what we like to say, start wherever, it doesn't matter, just start somewhere and then simulate a purchase. Once you go through one cycle, you know how to kind of swing it because your pocket will set the tone for what you can buy. Build a team that supports your MSA or location. Every MSA is different, right? So if my team doesn't know the MSA, then I shouldn't go into it, right? Even though I think I can handle. Uh, just remember, and just, you know, that number two and three is going to come back in a couple of slides down the way. Underwrite multiple cities to increase the statistical odd of winning. Because uh, if you think about it, if I'm looking for only value add assets, only 1990s or newer, only in San Antonio, then good luck getting the property and with the high certainty in a given time of the year. Right? Otherwise, we're just not. So what we believe in it to get into multiple cities at the same time, underwrite the same way. Same for the LPs, right? If you're investing in a certain hypothesis, just having a one hypothesis is very narrow path. So you need to have one or two different types of hypotheses, increase the you know, uh, your investment hypothesis by location, by asset class as much as you can. So you have a mixed bag and your likelihood of deployment of capital is higher. And the last thing is without mastering the underwriting, you will not be able to identify the deal. It goes for LPs and it goes for, especially for GPs. Uh, as an LP, you know, uh, you need to know how to read the OM, you need to know how to read the, uh, the forecast and the PowerPoint and ask some good sound questions. Then you go uh, make choices. And for the sponsor team, we got to go up and down uh, the PL, the balance sheets, the left and right, every single thing, right? So underwriting is a crucial uh, way to making sure that we are making right assumptions. So uh, this is a little bit about our acquisition tech stack. Uh, all the things that we talk about here is based on what we are working on. So uh, last uh, webinar, we talked about Monday, Red IQ on Client Harbor. That's our acquisition deal underwriting site. And at the bottom right here, you could see that, that three locations that we're underwriting mostly. Okay, and our research, our market research or tech stack, uh, we mostly use Red IQ a lot and we collect some data on Monday and client are not a whole lot, but we use CoStar and LoopNet. We have access to both. All of the massive masters, they have CoStar access because we believe that is a table stake to be a sponsoring team. You must have access to CoStar. It's just the way it goes, right? To drive a car, you need a license, you need a CoStar. On top of that, we have Rionomy. Uh, not everything is perfect. CoStar has its own flaws. Rionomy has its own flaws, but if you bring it together, uh, you have a good view of it. Uh, so you can kind of cross check with each other. Sometimes Coaster will have better information or terms or notes on the debt. Sometimes Realme will have it. 
sometimes Realm you will figure out better, you know, transaction history than CoStar. Sometimes CoStar will have better rent comp than Realm. And then we use a bunch of other stuff, but those two are the, uh, those three are the biggest one that we have. And yes, we have a negotiated price for, for CoStar. So everybody on our master's program, uh, they, we pay at cost. Okay. All right, so uh, this is one of the things to keep in mind. What we call is strategic insight. So uh, the economic profit, the economic profit will have two things. So, so this is a study by McKinsey, um, 2017 to 2011. So 2017, 11, they did another iteration, I think three years ago. Uh, what it shows, if even though we do the same thing, depending on where we execute that same thing, our profit margin will be different. So I'll give an example. We all work 24 hours, right? Uh, let's see, first case, well, best case will be we are coming from, let's see, we, we graduated from school, we got our first job. First, so I can I can apply my 40 hours to a large organization uh, with a large organization which is growing versus not growing big stale, we will have a different kind of a, you know, uh, income level. If the company is growing alongside your growth, then your income will go up. And then if the company is not growing, only you're going, income could go up, but not at, at the same pace or something else. Economic profit depends on the industry and also the company. In, in, in this case, it will be the location and that. So what we believe the market matters, asset size matters, class matters, and deal sourcing matters. And everything matters when you look at a deal. So when, when we get a deal, first question I ask, who sent it? Let's say Joe sent it. Then we ask question, how many deals that Joe has done? Zero. All of a sudden, there's a confidence level versus another Billy who sent us the deal who has done 10 deals, right? There's a deal sourcing will matter. Asset class will matter too. Certain asset class will behave a certain way. Last three, four years uh, or up until 2022, they all converse in the same price point, but now they have divert and they have separated out. So asset class will matter. Size will matter uh, because when we underwrite anything less than 50 units, you can turn that out in less than 90 days. 50 to 100, it's going to take three, four months. 150 to, I mean, 100 to 150 units, give or take less than six months, you can turn the whole thing around. 150 is going to take longer. 250, it's going to be even longer. 300 units are plus, it's years to go. So market, size, class, and deal, everything matters when you look at a deal as you go through. Okay. All right, so location. And you know, a little bit context right the first we talk about here the location matters then the question is how do we define what the location is right and how do we define is that really matters within a location so typically uh, everybody like just like everybody else we look at city county zip code characteristics income population then we apply our own understanding of the location population density buy selectivity cap rate and everything else so we we force rank as much as we can to kind of separate out the relative strength of the property. So the way we do it is, uh, this is what we call it a fishbone structure. It goes from left to right. Uh, again, we remember you're investing on based on a pro forma. As a GP, you're buying based on a pro forma. So what it really means that how do we build confidence on my pro forma? And the certain things we can control and certain things we cannot. So in this, today's case, I'll focus mostly on revenue. So on the revenue side, it's the controllable and the you know, uncontrollable. And the uncontrollable is the population growth and income growth. There's nothing you and I can do uh, that's going to decide, at least assuming we don't own big companies, we're not Elon Musk. There's nothing we can, you can I do that's going to drive you know, 10,000 or 1,000 families into our location that we're going to buy the property at, right? So that is not. What we should do, we should ride the wave. Right. Other one on the controllable, the how much we can grow the rent, how much you can force appreciate, that has that it was in our control. That rent growth has somewhat of a market driven and also the value add. Right. Market will push it through a certain amount. Inflation happens, rent, rent goes up organically. And but I can also fix up the unit and do it. So what's in our control? is rent growth via the value add, assuming there is a gap between the today's uh, you know, rent and where the property rent is. And the uncontrollable, it isn't. So what we should do, we should find our assets within the uncontrollable segment as much as we can. But then this one, and this is where it gets interesting. If everybody knows everything, 
then how do you make sure that you get something special, right? Or if everybody knows a certain segment is the best, then we're going to crowd at the area and then we're going to fight on the price. So we got to have something special. So let's let's look at it. What locations um, you know, will have better uncontrollable? Number two, as we're getting into those markets, how do I compete with others, right? All right. So first thing we take a look at it again, we have done those studies for the most of the US. Uh, we took census data for a little over 1400 uh, counties. Then we cut the data based on the agency debt uh, assumption. And based on the agency debt, what we say is that look, lenders have more information than we do. They will always have it. So I'm not gonna fight the market. I'll be on the side of the market. So wherever lenders go, we'll go. Wherever they wanna invest, we'll invest. And the others, I don't have to be oddball as much of a time, but we can take a contrarian position from the market, which is other investors, but not with the lenders because they have more information. So we did this study and based on the study, we identified our markets, but I'll give you a little bit more how we kind of went about it. So this is the Texas triangle that we talk about, Houston, San Antonio uh, and Dallas area. Then in between you got the Austin and Waco and then other tertiary market. First thing we ask, okay, how big is the market? bigger the you know, the size, more the likelihood I can get something. So on the right side, it's your asset size. So you got the DFW area, $162 billion worth the asset. Houston, $105 billion worth the asset. That value has been changing quite a bit, but this is today, I pulled the data from Costa today. Austin, 73 billion, San Antonio, 31. So if you just, look at purely from the statistical and a perspective, we want to buy an asset. Odds of winning out of a 31 billion versus odds of winning out of 162 billion. Just that. And odds of winning DFW area versus odds of winning and everything else. So if you roll them all up, Texas market alone is $371 billion market. But the sales volume is a 2.9 billion only, plus 12 months. So market is at a standstill. Rightfully so, because equity pressure, the cost of equity and the turmoils, and it wasn't ready to sell. So all in all, what we do know, if we were to invest in somewhere in the US, uh, we assumed the revenue perspective, Texas is a growth market, jobs are moving, everybody's moving. The DFW area had their boom because of one of the biggest reasons is the US-China separation of the and the fabrication went to DFW, then some fabrication went to Austin. The supply chain, how the Mexico-US relationship changed, that is changed the dynamic of the San Antonio, and we got the port for the Houston. So overall, we like Texas. We, we want to come back and buy assets. And now look at the size. It's at $371 billion, $371 billion. We barely have $200 million. There's plenty of assets to buy within it. Uh, so as you as investor, and that's they say there's a good, you know, good foundation, good fundamentals that is working for Texas, right? And those are the big markets there. I took out the rest of the markets as you go. Okay. All right. Now, key things to remember one more other thing. If you look at this, again, this is the aggregate. It's it's all rolled up to, you know, from brand new all the way down to 1950s product. It's all mixed back. I haven't separated that yet. I have one chart that I'll do the separation. But on that note, if you take a look at the, the bottom on San Antonio, almost 13% vacancy. Then Austin, almost 14%. And the Houston, 11%. DFW, 10%. That's market as a whole, right? Austin, yes, it's mostly because look at the new construction ratio, right? It's almost three times. Uh, they can handle 12,000, but they have 34,000 coming up. And Houston, not a whole lot. That has an impact there. Dallas is growing. It's almost double, but still, you know, it is absorbing much higher pace than Houston. But on the flip side, if you look at DFW, they have a rent, you know, a negative rent growth. It's a flat to negative at this point. Houston has a slightly uptick. So Houston is one of the market has came out to the rent growth the fastest because Houston took the biggest bidding in the last two years because of the taxes insurance. We live in a capitalist society. Market has to come through. So Houston is coming back out. Austin took the biggest hit. So we're expecting Austin to have another negative rent growth for another year, year and a half. 
um, because all the new units are coming through. So they should be delivered by 2025, early 2026. So this rent growth will, uh, will be there for a little bit. Then San Antonio, uh, it's a negative this year. It should be flat next year. Then it should come back on. Okay. Uh, then this is the, okay. The first thing is value versus inventory. So we know the market size. And now we're going to ask the question, okay, let's, let's look at some pie charts. So this is a force ranked pie chart. This is MSA by value. Bigger the box, bigger it is. I love this force fitting chart because visually you can tell. Just by looking at it, I run about 23 markets, Dallas, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio takes the cake for everything else. And then you got the Oklahoma City, right? If you really think about it, uh, given all things equal, do I build a business in Oklahoma City uh, that has only $8 billion of the business or the market value? Versus I go to the second best thing, which is San Antonio, 31 billion. Where do I have odds of success? Where will I, where, where will I have more uh, vendors, more property management companies, more competition, bigger the place, bigger more it is. And you also have more competition. On the other side, you have more flexibility because you can swap out the vendor one to a vendor two. You can swap out the property management company one to a two, vice versa, right? All right, let's look at the other side, the inventory by MSA. So DFW, it's $161 billion value. They have about 800. Houston, it's one of five. Look at the ratio, $61 billion less. But the unit count, it's only $100,000. I mean, it's 100,000 unit less. So Houston, by design, just for looking at it, much, much more uh, lower priced than Dallas. It's not cheaper price, it's lower priced because of other stuff that I'll show you. And then the San Antonio, from Houston, Austin, and San Antonio. Take a look at this. is the cool part of the Austin. Austin and San Antonio, and, you know, they have 220,000 units, and San Antonio, Austin has almost 300,000, 80,000 difference. But look at the price difference. Almost two and a half X. So about 20% more unit count, but almost, you know, more than 250% of price increase. You know, so that's the, and that's the interesting part. So you, by design, but looking at it, you could tell in Austin, you're going to have less units, so smaller units, more competition, prices high uh, versus Houston versus San Antonio versus DFW. But DFW, it's a steady state and it's going. Houston, you'll have a cheaper price or lower price. But that is not cheaper price, right? Next one, keeping the inventory MSA the same, we look at price by unit, exactly what I was talking about. Austin, we have 219, it is, it's the market aggregate. Uh, per door is $219,000 per door. Uh, Midland USA, 150, Houston, 143. Now, if I'm an investor and if I, I want to buy some assets, the question is on the right side, Midland is somewhere here at the bottom right. On the price side is 148 versus my Houston is 143, but the availability is huge. So I know there's something in the Midland area driving the price versus something in the Houston area keeping the price at where it is. So now we got to go figure that out and then decide whether something we should buy or not, right? So this is a cool way of navigating. So if I'm a brand new investor, I don't know anything. Or, you know, uh, if I'm an LP, I want to invest. I love Austin. It's cool. A lot of people coming in and it, it shows in the value. But just by looking at this chart, I should be able to say, Austin, it's an appreciation play because I'm paying a top end dollar to come in. The market has to grow for me to grow with it. Austin will not be a cash flow play. Versus if I get a Houston, usually it should be you know, faster cash flow than anything else. On the Austin, if the market swings, it's going to swing harder than the market. That means both ways. If in other way, if Dallas goes has a negative 1%, Austin will have more. And Dallas have a positive 1%, Austin will have more, right? So when I come into the Austin market, I should be ready for it that, hey, my market swings, it's going to swing quite a bit. So if you're an LP, you should ask for the sensitivity. If you're a general partner, you should run the model as well as you kind of get into it. Okay. All right. So let's see. We are, you know, we decided, hey, uh, in this particular case, we like. You know, DFW area, we like Houston area. And we're going to go compete in the you know, DFW and the Houston area. Mentally, we're ready. 
my and on my DFW, 175 dollar, uh, 175 k unit. Houston is 143. Let's drill down one more time because not all locations are made the same, built the same, that don't behave the same. Question is, how do we know? All right. So on the top, I took a three-star expense per square foot based on the uh, DFW area. I took the top five. And then at the bottom, I took the Houston um, three-star expense, uh, expense per square foot. Again, for a massive side, we look at them as a guidance, but we don't quite use them. We use hard data from our own database from Red IQ based on the other actual that we do, but we do a sense check based on this. This is semi-public. That means if you have cold tracks as you have it, ours is a private information because we built it over time. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this section. Let's compare DFW and Houston. DFW has a market, dollar sixty-three, but if you take a look, the downtown Dallas is three twenty-four, because mostly high-rise, right? And then you have Arlington, dollar five, downtown Fort Worth, dollar seventy-seven, Denton, you know, dollar sixteen. Now, if I'm a brand new person, I've done one or two deals in different market, I like Dallas, I'm going to go come in and guess what I used? The market average $1.63. If I bought in Arlington, fine, I got some extra benefit. If I bought in Allen or McKenna, I am in a world of pain, right? If we take a look Houston, interesting. Alif, 70 cents. It's an older part of the Harris County, no issue, no mod taxes and you go. And if we take a look here, Austin County, Dollar forty-two, Baytown, ninety-one. So it all depends on where we at. Your taxes will be different. So we need to know what happens. Interesting part of Baytown. I got quite a bit of properties. They have two taxes: the Baytown, also the ISD. Uh, so when you stack them up, it's pretty high. But when you go to just the county appraisal office in Baytown and you use just the number, you're missing out about thirty percent of the cost. Uh, so yes, I missed it when I got into Baytown first time. Next thing is, and uh, I got a lawsuit, a tax lawsuit because I forgot to pay taxes. Then I realized there was an ISD tax and there is a county tax. So your total tax is much higher than what you see. Now let's take a look at insurance. Dallas area, about 26 cents. It ranges from a 25 cents to about 30 cents or 32 cents, depending on where you at. Houston has a wider range. It starts high. So as you can see, the minimum, it's about 35 cents in Austin County. This is a little bit more outside, but most of the A live and Baytown is higher. It's closer to the on the coast, but it's about 40s, right? So you have to understand that insurance and taxes as you go. So this is just an example how Houston, within the Houston, how Dallas, within the Dallas will behave uh, differently, taxes and insurance as you go. Uh, so once you do understand, if you look at the total one on the right side, you can see, your average post capex, uh, it's gonna range between a four to about I don't know, $10 that you had depending on where you're at. But in Houston, you don't hit the $10 at all. What it tells you going back, DFW, the downtown area, one of the most expensive area, that's a class A location. You should have the highest rent, hence they have the highest tax. They should be able to behave a certain way than somewhere in Baytown as you have. Again, we, we, we don't know the market, we haven't got in it, but looking at this, we're extrapolating that. And then we say, hey, if I buy a property there, I should adjust the assumption to kind of get into it. Right. So on that note, this is, you know, uh, as a part of our, uh, our program, uh, we look at this data all day. We run crunch numbers all day long, almost every day, uh, two, three, four hours a day till we get um, all the numbers fine tuned, right? For us, we strongly believe that uh, I know underwriting, it doesn't mean that I really know underwriting, right? Uh, typically when we say I know underwriting, that means I know how the Excel model works. I plug in a number, it spits out another number. But I really know underwriting, that means that I can go back in and really defend my assumptions as I go through. I can fine tune my admin, my payroll, my water utilities maintenance, and I'm nicely parking the property in such a way that I have you know, downside risk mitigated as much as I could. And I have positioned myself on the upside and I'll profit as much as I can. So, and that's, that's our program. And uh, here we go. That's all I had for today. And so I'll stop sharing and open for Q&A. All right. Awesome, who's head spinning? 
I always use, so it's funny. So my explanation of markets was a little bit different. I always referred to San Antonio as baby bears forage. It was never hot. It was never cold. Um, not quite so analytical, but, uh, <laughs> you know, cause, cause I live in Austin, right? Again, it, Austin market is volatile, L lots of sexy, but lots of volatility. Yes. I mean, as long as you're okay with it, right? You know, you know a version of it. We don't know how exactly it's going to play out anytime, but we can make some assumptions and get ready for it as you kind of go through. So any, any so questions, for, you can see, okay. feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, pop them in the chat. I know there was a lot of numbers. Who's moving to Texas that isn't here? Man, there's got to be see. a question. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, I'm a sure lot of building in Austin to be absorbed. Definitely. It's a lot. Austin has overgrown for a little bit, but it's going to come back down. So let me share something. Where is that? Okay. Ta -ta. This is the Houston data that I'm sharing. As you can see, it gives you a directional view of where we're at. And then you kind of go back in with that tone and decide which which area we like which area we don't like, which area you know, we should go buy and which area we should stop buying it, right? So for us, anything that runs on the coastal area, it's a no-go for us. Coastal means the hard coastal, like Corpus Christi, Bay City, then Galveston, then Port Arthur. Uh, so those are you know, the Liberty County on the east side. We're not pushing it at all. We're holding it is mostly because the cost overrun that we have. And it, it, it's going to take a little bit more to kind of catch up. So we're looking at it. So if you look at the first uh, one to two, and this is a four to five as you go. Now, the older the property, they will run a different way. And depending on where you add, it's, it's going to run really different way. And the insurance side, you can really see and how it's behaving that way as you go through. We have as low as 40, uh, sorry, Ailey 57 cents. Then we have North Galveston 71 cents. Oh, there you go. That's my that's my data point. Uh, and then Brazoria County is 64 cents. So I'll give you a case in point. Brazoria County, we had quite a bit of assets. And one of the interesting part of Brazoria County was the spread between the market price and the appraisal price is, was always huge. It's almost like half, maybe 60%. So that was the interesting part that we had. Then we got a chatter that they are doing something about the Texas. So what we found out later down the way is that uh, the county commissioner came out and he said, I need to improve the revenue of Marbrosaria County. And they, they brought some consultants. They did some study. They said, yep, the fastest way you're going to grow your uh, income is hit the commercial property taxes because they're too far and uh, far away from the Harris County and the other counties. And they literally doubled everybody's tax in one year. We were out. It worked out for us, but some of the things we don't know, we don't see it unless you're thick of it. So now Brazoria County caught up with everything else, we're fine. Sometimes we don't know, like in you know, San Antonio, the insurance for San Antonio was that wide before, that San Antonio has one of the cheapest insurance in between Houston and Dallas area, but then they caught up, right? So it's really cool how those subtle things that if you kind of sort of see it coming, it can stay, but if you can't, then you get stuck. And we are stuck in some of the assets as well, but we're fighting it through. Uh, but those data points are extremely important. And most of them don't happen unless you own it. So there are a couple of questions. Okay. Um, someone is asking, do we think Texas is an emerging market state? <laughs> and I think it has been like a growth state for more than 10 years um, and, and continues to be an economic driver. I mean, the, the state itself is definitely, you know, just it's on fire. Um, there's there's no two ways to put it. You look at U-Haul, anything that's moving, you know, um, I know I live in Austin and I think two thirds of the population is now from California. Um, and then and then there were was a question about some of the smaller markets, you know, Waco, um, College Station, you know, that are in the triangle. Um, they're again very unique, correct? Yeah. Um, so let me walk you through a little bit on the market side. 
So before I go, what we measure, uh, a couple of things. One, we measure uh, population growth, but then adult population growth. I'll give you an example of what the difference is. Harris County population growth, if you Google it, you'll see it increases. But Harris County itself got a little over 2 million people. A lot of married couples, a lot of newborns. Newborn don't make a difference in our population growth. So we measure adult population growth, not the total population growth. There's a difference. And the second thing we measure, uh, migration of the people, which is there, but what type of migration is happening? Uh, let me kind of say that before I get into those markets. Migration, yeah, we hear people from California, it's a net moving state, people from New York, net moving state, they're all moving to Texas market. Agree. Second question we ask, who are they moving in? Are they $50,000 worth of job? Or is it $100,000 worth of job? Or is it the half a million dollar worth of job? So based on that, you could say, hey, which market is growing what way, right? And then you also take a look what's happening in the, in the local market area. So to us, Houston, it's a, a very big subtle market. There's no oomph on the Houston. It's a steady course. It's big enough to have a heavy weight, but there's no big push and wave is happening because it's just big and the majority of the jobs are all and gas driven. But during the COVID time, we took out almost 2,000 highest paid jobs out of the market. Uh, so I used to work at Shell. Uh, during the COVID time, I was there. Uh, we used to, and I used to uh, go to a Houston Economic Council. What happened about a little over 2,000 uh, subsurface engineering or petro physics type jobs, we took it away. That's not gonna come back out. And they make a lot of money. If you've been with Shell for 10 years, 15 years, you'll clear 150 to 200 grand if you're a petrophysicist. And if you got two couples, you're making 300 to 400 grand. And times that 2,000, it went away. So Houston became subtle. Uh, but the job growth on the port side is increasing. So overall job growth is there, it's subtle, but we are becoming a solid, more solid middle class, which is different than DFW area, right? Some part of the DFW, sorry, no, hold on, go back. Some part of Houston is going a certain way. Uh, so money is moving in Houston from the east side to the west side, especially the Northwest Quadrant is really good uh, for the growth pattern perspective. So that's Houston. If you go to DFW area, look, the US China separation is real. All the higher manufacturing, all, most of them came to DFW area and um, Austin area, right? The TI, the GE, the Motorola's, all those, and you know, the fab shops are here. The Taiwan is a big deal. And that Taiwan fab shop came to Austin and DFW, and those are high end jobs. Uh, one thing to remember I have Amazon warehouse next to my house, hypothetically, there's a huge job growth. True, but what type of job? $60,000, $100,000, $200,000, half a million dollars. Amazon Warehouse came to my neighborhood. It's different than Shell and Exxon came to my neighborhood. If Shell and Exxon comes okay. in, your salary level is high, house price will go up at that, that speed versus Amazon Warehouse shows up. Their price is different and they will drive a certain type of, you know, um, House buy and house buying oh, characteristics, right? Investment and then how did get their email? And uh, on that note, that Texas is growing. I mean, I have some data. I'll show that to you. Texas is growing. We like it. What we do understand here on the uh, the college station, it's a good market, but that's a student centric market. Uh, running a property in a regular market is different than a student market. Their characteristics is different. It's extremely competitive and you got to have a specialty. What I meant to say, if you go to College Station, you got a bunch of apartment back to back to back. And if you are not designed the operations, your framework, your KPI based on the students, and all of a sudden I show, a massive shows up who doesn't own a student housing except one, then all of a sudden we're starting from the backside, right? We don't have any leverage. So we shied away from College Station. That's because we need to build a specialty around student housing, which we chose not to do it, but that puts us on a different business model. Um, that's where we are, but some people, they love it. Uh, then also the clean market, it's not our play. I mean, uh, not usual play because of you know, the job, job you know, how the job and the movement happens with the uh, Dharmish, the, the Waco, smaller sub-market, which is a very good, strong market. Uh, we, the pie of the Waco is small enough for us not to get in. Uh, but Waco and the call station, those are really good market that we like it. 
San Antonio, we really like it, especially the Northeast quadrant. Um, it's it's really good for us. Um, the I-35 corridor is big for us. Uh, anything on the east side of Houston, we don't go. It just movement doesn't happen that often. Okay, interesting secondary market. So, AI. So, Austin, when when do you think? I know we we're looking at um, retail. We already have one retail development here in Austin, and we're looking at more of a lifestyle center. When what would you need to see happen before you wanted to get back in the multifamily game here? All right. So get in when others are scared because multifamily to wave it takes time. So what happened? Everybody saw it coming. That because based on the permit, everybody saw that the buildup of the of the inventory market slowed down. So that's a, I built up extra, and it takes about Austin takes about two to three years to get your permit. We have one. It took us two and a half, almost three years to get the permit done. That means if there is no permit today, because we're not pulling any permit, numbers not working out. But guess what? We are creating a void three years from now. So if I can make a number work today, I should go push that project today, such that three years from now, when they go through the market correction, price tapers out, then there is not any new inventory, but us. So Eddie, what I would say, get in it now because you are adjusting everything in today's price if you can make it work and you go about it. Okay. So yes, Austin is a good market for us. Uh, we like it. Uh, we could not crack the code Austin on the apartment side uh, because of two reasons. Number one, uh, Austin has a bunch of smaller units and a bunch of big units. Either you go from a five, $10 million to like a 70, $80 million. 70, 80 million dollars of the institutional money, their expectation is different. They have lower cost of capital. We have a higher cost of capital. We cannot compete. We said we're out. And the smaller subsection uh, for us, everybody was paying top end. But we saw it that, hey, if I buy 30 units, if two of the units are vacant extra and I'm paying on the high end, my break even is high, too much of a risk. So we, we kind of held off on the Austin. But on the other side, on the Austin, we love the retail space. Retail space has natural barrier to entry, which is all of a sudden less competition. And we do town centers and larger retail places that has another natural barrier to entry because it's a recourse loan most of the time. So all of a sudden your buyer pool shrinks. Then Austin is a growth market. It's a high-end growth market. And people love to, if you earn more, you spend more. So hence, you're going to go to the store to buy your next you know, pizza or breakfast or whatever the you know, uh, the next tortoise tacos, right? Then that revenue we went after. That's why we're bullish in Austin and some part of San Antonio and Houston and Dallas for the retail space because jobs are growing and you know, money's coming in. The money has to go through somewhere and we are positioning ourselves that way. There you go. Good question. So backdrop of this one that when we uh, designed ourselves uh, into who we want to be uh, we like that part that hey two things on the apartment side and also on the and on the developer side as you go through because yeah market could adjust which is fine but the retail space it's been working all right let me see um i wanted to share this one I downloaded the Excel file earlier today. Share my screen. Yep. So this is my population growth. Uh, this is my population growth. And I'll hide everything else and job growth. And this is the DFW area. You can see in this market, you are still in a good spot. And look at the average median income, right? Now, San Antonio is 72,000 niche median income. And this is 77,000, pretty good given how small it is. DFW is 85, pretty high. Then Austin is really high. So if you think about it in Houston, class A, or let's say class B will be 75,000. In DFW, class B will be 85,000. Style different, rent different, everything else different. And San Antonio is that, but Austin is much higher. So, and the, and the household income growth, look at the growth, right? And Austin is growing at a very good spot at close to there. Houston is growing as well. So when you take a look at it, Texas is still is a good market to get in. All right, I'll stop sharing. Awesome. Any other questions?
as I mentioned before, too, if you came a bit late, don't worry. Um, these are uploaded about 48 hours to our YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you won't even have to let me remind you. You'll get a notice. There's Mike. He's been driving around Houston all day looking at properties. <laughs> properties Michael. and uh, partners, so. Mike closed some yeah. deals today. How many deals did you close, Mike? Two or three? He's in the closing uh, mode today. I think we two, two one one a partner deal and one uh new opportunity, new development opportunity deal. So we we closed. We the team closed. So no, it's good. Hey, I, this was really cool, and I it's uh, those that showed up. I think got a special treat with this uh ever i hadn't seen i've seen this but i hadn't seen the way you were presenting tonight shire that that was really really cool uh focus on texas i know we've looked at it as like across the u.s that view but i hadn't looked at it on the texas view so really really cool nice to see that tonight so those that showed up got a special treat i think we had some tech tech problem, but those who showed up, I'll have something special. Let me dig out our own handy-dandy chart if I can find it real quick. Uh, once you turn off the video, uh, I'll share that. This is our in-house uh, analysis. Let me see. Now, good. Thank you, everybody, for some good set of questions, by the way. Awesome. So if you enjoyed yourself, we expect to see you back next Wednesday with a friend. Um, make sure you invite them. So next Wednesday, we're talking about the Colorado market. We very different market, um, kind of similar to Austin in a sort of a little bit way, but not really. So you're going to learn a lot about it. Uh, we do have two smaller assets there. Um, we have some of our team are based there. We're actually going to be out there early September. So if you're in that area, um, we're going to be running a meetup and uh, property tour. So we like to do property tours. And again, anybody in Dallas, um, come and join us. It's going to be awesome property tour, awesome event. We're going to go, if you can imagine eight hours of this, when you come to a massive capital, it's, it's, it's a, you, your head hurts at the end of the day. Um, and it, it's, uh, but it's a good hurt. It's a like, wow. It, it, it's been fun. Uh, we yeah. appreciate everybody who joined in. So I'll share some of the more information uh, as you go once you start the video. It's kind of a cool. Uh, so I, I, I think I got it. I got my old handy dandy stuff at some point. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming and we will see you next week. Oh no, hold on. Marie, well, just hold on. Video. Okay.